Snibby. He is a fellow in the American Institute of Architects. He is principal in the firm Land Lab Incorporated of New York City. He's a graduate of Harvard University, and he studied with Walter Gropius at Harvard. He was awarded the Merit Award from AIA in 1962 for the Tennis Pavilion at Princeton University. In addition, he was associated with Edward Durrell Stone on the Indian Embassy and is a master planner and architect for the State University College at Geniso, New York. Mr. Snibby will talk on the Hand Loser Project, a new town of 60,000 people to be built in a mountainous area. Mr. Snibby. How does it work? It's the lousy little button. Mm. Isn't that terrible? How did you do it? You did it. Fix me. Oh, here it is. No wired for sound. Huh? Works, doesn't it? Okay, thanks. Which one? It should be this one. What? This one? I want to go back, yeah. This is a uh, schematic design of a town satellite town for uh, 60,000 people on uh, 10,000 acres. And uh, it was developed, it started when uh, my client, Mr. Hanlos, wanted to build a house in Aspen. It's true. And we went there and saw this kind of area and incidentally saw the most functional and effective primitive house that you could possibly make, of course. And uh, we looked around and found we, uh, yeah, that's right. We saw land like this and we also saw areas where they were digging roads into the mountainsides and cutting down the trees. And uh, we also, we saw a uh, cement truck trying to turn around on a 12-foot road on a mountain. And it was disastrous. And people carting these enormous girders and concrete and so on up to the mountainside. And uh, aside from the destruction to the whole thing, of course, it's, it's absolutely beautiful when it's right there. And as, as the environmentalists will tell you, there's a tiny, thin layer of material that is very disturbable on mountains so that you can, uh, you can louse it up real easy, particularly with underground utilities and roads and so on. So uh, we uh, looked at it, and we wondered whether you couldn't do something that wouldn't hurt it. So why couldn't you bring something in in a carton, a, a whole bunch of parts in a carton, and uh, fly it in and just attach it to the mountain? And that's it. It's all there. And of course, it would have to have, you'd have to treat the utilities the same way. You'd have to have them above ground so they didn't hurt it. 
And this was the first sketch of, of the beginning idea. And we went along to build a uh, very rough model. And uh, incidentally, it was such a complicated sort of crystalline shape that uh, when I started to do the drawings, I had to do them from the model instead of from the thing. And then we started to worry about how, to, how the thing would connect to the ground. Actually, these drawings are instructions to the model maker. But in doing that, we started to work out how the, how the cross connections are made, how you, uh, in other words, all this time, mind you, we didn't know it was going to work at all. How it goes into the ground and how the connection is made to the sides. And uh, of course, how the turnbuckles would connect and so on. And then, then it was a question of finding, well, how would it look inside? You know, what would it be like? It would be a lot of glass. and What, what kind of character would it have? So we went to a great engineer, Leo Zetlin, and uh, he did an analysis of it. Isn't that a great big picture of a letter? Oh my God. <laughs> the marvelous. <laughs> At any rate, he did. He, he would love that. <laughs> but he did. Uh, but he did his own analysis of the drawings I'd done, and. Uh, had to color them all so he could find them. And what he, what he did was to add two wires here and here and here and here. There's four, really, for stability. And he made a catenary out of the one that holds up the roof. But interestingly enough, and he sized all the wires and so on, and he designed it for 150 mile an hour winds. And uh, interestingly enough, the, the most important wires in the whole thing are these. They're the biggest, they're two inches. And they go from this floor right here up to that connector. And this one, this cross one here. The top wires are inch and a half. And all the rest of the wires are only one inch. Well, now, when you build this thing, you're going to barely see the supports. And of course, steel in tension is the most economical way to build it. There's only 12 tons of steel in the whole building. Now, he came back and he said that the structural configuration of the house and concluded is both technically and practically feasible. And I said, OK, Lev, well, that's fine. How much does it cost? Because I thought, my god, it's got to cost millions, you know, to build one of these. And he said, well, you can put up the, you can put the rock anchors in the mountain. <laughs> that's one of the rock anchors. <laughs> Great. Technology. <laughs> you just help me out again, would you? I'm sorry. <laughs> you took a picture of that. How are we doing now? Is that seems to work? All right. I shouldn't move too much. Number one. OK. So I said, well, how much would it cost? He said, well, you, you can put the rock anchors in. And the basic steel structure, now don't misinterpret this, because you can put the, the floor structure in steel only, not the skin of the building or the glass or any of the any utilities or anything. But you can put that basic structure erected for $10,000. Now, that's kind of comparable to a foundations and a structure of an ordinary house. I mean, just the structure itself. So I thought, well, if we can be comparable that way and be able to live on top of a mountain, then there's something more to this than just a house in Aspen. And my client and I felt that what we really ought to do is to, his decision was to develop this as a study for a city and use this use a suspended structural system as the basis for being able to build on mountains economically so that you could leave the arable flatland free 
And since this is a recreation conference, I have to say for recreation. But it's for, it's for anything you want to use it for. Multiple, multiple use. Now, at that time, I mean, society is so complex that you can't do anything all by yourself anymore at all. I don't think. Uh, I mean, I, I try to do everything, but I can't, you can't really do it. And I called in, uh, I conned Frank Ferguson, a friend of mine in Penn State, to help us with this. And he's a great planner and a lovely guy. And he just said, OK, build a, build a thing like Manhattan in the middle of a valley, so it's really urban, and concentrate the hell out of it. So it's a very compact thing. Leave all the land free, and leave the land free around it. Go up from the, and we all talked about this together, and I don't know who's responsible for what idea, which is the nifty part of design in a big scale, because, or any design. And that is, you can't tell who the author is. And that's marvelous, because it all starts to cook. And once it starts, then everything's added and gets there. But you go up the hillsides on a funicular. And well, that's, you know, that's the only way to get up a mountain, really. So that seems sensible. But then we thought, well, we'll, we'll locate those functions which have light service demands, like uh, cultural centers. I'll have to hold it. It's OK. Like cultural centers and so on, which we thought would have light service demands. And uh, put the neighborhood schools at the base of the mountain and uh, start from there. What would the inside of the city look, by, look like? This is one of the first sketches of that. And. Uh, how would it be? You'd have to have stations on the mountain where the funicular stopped. And uh, how would that look? And then in making these sketches, it realized that actually that model outside is that little, is that drawing up there. Let me see if I can find this thing here, this one. And, uh, but we realized that you can make any shape or form or character or whatever you want with it. And uh, those things connecting them, I thought, would be like that, uh, covered walkways that are waterproof, that are also suspended. And then you get to the buildings through elevators. Now, that hadn't, that's been done to some degree. But what we want to do is apply it to a mountain. And of course, we went back to Lev Zetlin again. And he said, well, let's do it that way. Let's try that. And uh, I said, now, what to do is to compare this with ordinary roads and underground utilities as far as costs are concerned and uh, on a mountain. And uh, he thought that we could do this at least at a comparable figure. And then the idea occurred to uh, of course, put the services in the in the walkway, so you can always get to them, and they're never underground, so that you'd have to dig up a mountain. And uh, they, it's wide enough to run a golf cart or a uh, bicycle or walk or and all that. So it was, we found out that that was possible, and he thought <laughs> they have advantages over conventional roads and so on, as he developed his study. But it is economic, and it is practically feasible in relation to roads or buried utilities. And it doesn't hurt the environment at all. And you can get to the stuff. Well, while we were out in Aspen, we watched him put up, and fortunately, I don't have any pictures of it, but we watched him put up the Cristo Valley curtain. And uh, these guys got so involved with the whole thing. It was remarkable how they did it. And, this guy's up in that box. See that? He's way the hell up there. <laughs> and when you see that happen, you realize that you've got, you got some people who have to have that kind of courage and skill to, to build a new kind of city. 
But uh, so then we thought, well, we'd better try a funicular. So we went up to the Bronx, and they built this from one side of the Bronx Zoo to the other. It was a very elegant idea, and it was built by a Swiss firm. And uh, it just so happened that uh, Zetland's office had been working on uh, the funicular to go over the Hudson River from 59th Street to Welfare Island. It's now Roosevelt Island. So he'd made some research, and he, he told me that there are 8,000 uh, funicular systems in effect in the world today, and, uh, and that they even use them for construction, which appealed to me a great deal, of course. So we went up in it. That's Pat, my wife. You can see New York from there. What we realized was that they're completely silent, and they're very, she's scared to death of heights and gets freezing cold in an airplane, you know? And she thought it was all right, so I felt, well, <laughs> it would work. We're just coming down now. The little machinery's on the left. It's quite beautifully done. Swiss do a lovely job. Now, building this for New York City, it's 2,400 feet. It's half a mile, cost a million dollars. But uh, I would say that almost a half of that is in the, down the drain in the bureaucracy. So it really isn't too damned expensive, the people getting out. Great long lines of people using it, really no problem. Now, going from there, if you wanted to create a colony of buildings on a mountainside, Starting with the uh, city, it's a little town center itself. This is a neighborhood to support 3,500 people. And this would have a delicatessen and a restaurant. It's the funicular stop and tennis courts and the gym and, you know, the pizza parlor and that kind of stuff. And you can get some milk at uh, 12 o'clock at night and so on. So it's a little town center, little offices. Of course, you have to have an architect's office in every architect's drawing. So there's, it's in there. <laughs> See that great space up there? That's mine. So. <laughs> anyway, any rate, proceeding along these, uh, well, well that's, a, that's a picture of the uh, station itself. Now these, the interesting thing is that these drawings, those little people there in this drawing, it's marvelous how you can blow it up, and photography does wonderful things for you. Those little people are like a sixteenth of an inch high in the drawing. You know, when you blow it up, it looks great. As you go, it gives it a sense of reality. I, I was amazed, but I had a marvelous photographer on it, so uh, he was able to do this. Now, you can build any damn kind of building you want. I mean, just anything with this system, and. Uh, it's fascinating to just see what kind of shapes and sizes, depending on the that. That's a bridge across a chasm. And uh, here's a whole cluster of them. You lease space in it, in that, and build whatever you please. <laughs> and the whole system is such that it doesn't make any difference to me what they do. <laughs> I'm serious. I really think you can build any damn thing in it at all. And the whole idea is to the whole idea is to have not one building look like a next one ever, any time. So we're back to the uh, station. There's a little one with a porch. You can imagine the fun doing this. I just, you know, I had such a great time. That's, a, that's the prototype. And there's a three-story job. And uh, there's a ziggurat that everybody likes, you know. <laughs> I throw one of those in. <laughs> and there's one with a, you build this box, this great thing, and then plug in whatever you like. But they're not all alike. I mean, just the structure itself is. And that's a hanging swimming pool. Probably have one of that. <laughs> that's great, you know, it's just, you can do anything. Now, up there is what we're just looking at, that little piece there. And uh, this is 10,000 people on the mountainside with a cultural center above and school down below. 
Uh, let's see if I got the right damn one. Okay, now we're looking down from the top. And uh, I've done a lot of uh, architectural work and I, I just became an administrator, you know, for a long time, for about 10 years. I hadn't done any drawings. And I realized that finally I could draw again. So I did all these drawings. And I had an absolute marvelous time. There's the satellite city. I mean, there's the host city. And the satellite city's here. And we're coming down in the funicular. And these are the, these are the glass uh, windows looking out. We were just looking at that little piece over there. There are five of these connected with the funicular. One road through the whole thing. And uh, in the middle of the road is a uh, uh, mass transit. And the mass transit can now be a funicular on wheels. So you can go from your house to the uh, transit system to work and back in the same system and not get out of the one thing and get into something else. Now I come down the hill. It's, it's a little frightening to get used to it. A lot of people got used to airplanes and they 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 can kill you <laughs> well, this is, you know, they got used to it that's the center of the town now the idea is to have utilities and service on the lowest level and automobiles and then people which is certainly not a new idea but I thought it would be nice to make it impossible to get hit by an automobile. That would be a nice idea. I mean, it's impossible. This would be like this, the center of the town, the civic center with little boutique shops. And I love palm trees. And you can build them, put them anywhere if you've got a contained environment. And uh, boutiques and restaurants. All kinds of displays, and of course the uh, the government center, place to sit, little electric carts to carry around, and fountains, and the whole works. That's the plan you looked at, and uh, you were looking from below here, out there, toward this. It's 300 feet square. It's about 300 feet high. Now, I did this whole plan purposely in these forms. So that, uh, it's just indicative of any damn shape you like. They're all suspended. You can put anything in there, circles, squares, rectangles, anything. So now, the question is, what do you, I have a ring of industry, about 80 acres, a uh, ring of commerce, which is big stores, and about 70 acres, and then health, education, and welfare as a ring and then the Civic Center. Now, when I did this, I was reading, uh, I had to look at Asher's as a, as a visual thing. I looked at Asher's work and his drawings. And you, I know you're familiar with them. And uh, realized that been a, without knowing it, that the center of the drawing indicates big buildings. And they get smaller, lower, as you go down. And it rubbed off on me, and I was so tickled, you know, that I really absorbed it without knowing it. You, you know Asher's stuff. You know, it's fantastic. And of course, my client is an artist, and he took my drawings and uh, made silk screens of them. Fantastic drawings. <laughs> you know, that was fun. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, he really did it. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the plan, none of these colors. <laughs> nothing. And I don't know why he put that red around there, just, just, but it's great looking, isn't it? <laughs> Everybody's just so pleased with it. And you got to, if you took, we cover 13.5% of the uh, land. And of course, if you took all of those houses, they cover the whole damn thing in uh, ordinary houses the way we built today. 
So uh, what I'm really doing, I think, is after this last uh, two and a half years, what I'm really doing, I think, is to set a, the only thing I'm trying to do is to set a framework for how to protect the environment. And the lifestyle is built by the people that are going to live there, not by me. And whoever wants to build whatever they damn please should be able to do it within this system. And so then, of course, we develop the house itself. This is a silk screen, too. And we did, he did just 30 of these. And it's just, you know, it's incredible, beautiful things. I'll show you the plan. The idea of the plan is to have an elevator, not stairs. To have uh, movable bathrooms, closets, and uh, everything in the house is movable. So you can just throw it off, throw out the stuff, or have as many rooms as you want. Change it all around. You can, if you're having a big party, you can move the kitchen back and the bathroom back. <laughs> because it's, uh, the, uh, the technology's here. I mean, we don't have to worry about that. We can do it easily. So I had it patented. It was a great, great uh, thrill if you've never done it. It costs about $2,000 and takes about two years. But it's fun to have. It looks good. But what I was surprised is that the structure can have one or more horizontally suspended platforms and can be enclosed for residential, commercial, and industrial uses. So fundamentally, it's a generic pattern for the structural system itself. It's not a design pattern. So you can build anything on that mountain with this idea. So there's the model that you see, you've seen outside, a photograph of it. And we just jazzed up the interiors with a nifty color. That's a magic marker. At Neat, my wife did that. She's very good at it. That's how it would look looking outside in the kind of dusk. Here's another shot of that thing. This guy, belfry has got strobe lights that he works with. And he does these photographs. And you, so you don't see what you see. I couldn't tell what the hell he's going to shoot. Because the light goes on just bing. And this is what comes out. It's fantastic. Now, we played with this, another model, and we kind of developed a light show, which I'll do kind of fast, because that's the end of it. That's it.